So they say variety is the spice of life. And yet, with all the devices that we use today, we mainly choose from two major architectures from you know, a handful of vendors, it's a bit of x86 from Intel and AMD, and ARM from you know, everybody else. However, there are more architectures in the world that make everything run. And the biggest one of them all, depending on who you ask, I'm gonna ask this guy in a second, is Z. Z has been around for decades, part of the IBM family. And a couple of years ago, we covered the IBM Telem processor as part of the Z16 infrastructure. You may have seen videos on this channel about it, how we talk about their major systems, talking about uh, uptime, reliability, uh, security, and then they have released uh, Linux One based Z systems in standard rack mount form factors. So the scope of the Z market is always forever expanding. Typically we talk about it in terms of data transaction processing and databases, but it's finding a foothold in many more industries today. This week at Hot Chips, IBM is announcing its next generation Telem 2 processor and AI Spire Accelerator. And with me is lead architect of Telem, fellow CTO of systems, Christian Jacoby. And we're gonna ask him a few questions. Welcome to the channel, Christian. Thank you, Ian. Glad to be here. Now, it's I first interacted with this guy when you first did the Telem presentation a couple of years ago at Hot Chips, mm -hmm. but we were remote. Well, so you pandemic. recorded it. Yeah. How was how was recording it on stage? Um back then, yeah. It was weird it was awkward we did the recording at the auditorium in yorktown with only three people in the audience and they were wearing masks while i did the recording we've got more than that here yeah it it, it, it was a bit weird i'm glad that this is behind us but uh the reaction to tell them i thought was pretty good everybody was excited to see a new z chip a new uh, z architecture based chip um and you guys it, we'll get into the sort of the details of that and, and, and uh, the current generation, but I wanted to you know talk a little bit about you and your background because you've been at IBM how many years now? Twenty two years. Did you sort of drop out of university and go straight to IBM? I did. Yeah. I, I finished my PhD and went straight to IBM uh, at the lab in Böblingen in Germany, actually. Okay, I, I've actually gone and visited there. It's uh, they're in the process of moving. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Uh, so, but you have this title of of fellow, fellow, senior fellow, uh, but it's the way I'd like to address um, you know approach this. Fellows, it's weird depending on which company I'm talking to. And IBM's got this like strict definition of a fellow. What, what's that all about? Um, IBM fellow is the highest technical level. Um, it's the highest technical appointment at IBM. Um, there's only about 70 fellows at IBM right now. And for a company of what, tens of thousands? Yeah, a little bit more than that even, yeah. <laughs> um, um, we have um, broad responsibility, like obviously fellows exist in all the major business units, mm -hmm. right? From consulting to software, cloud systems, um, and we generally advise on like the broad technical direction in, in which the company should be going. And fr from your side, you've come up through the um, architecture route through the business. I've come up through the chip development. I've spent most okay. of my time in chip development, mostly on the Z systems, but I've also done a couple of uh, stints in power systems. Okay. Um, so, so, so what does chip development mean? Are we talking raw core architecture? Are we talking about you know, ancillaries? Are we talking SOC? Are we talking packaging? Are we talking all of the above? I've done pretty much all <laughs> of the above at one point or the other, right? I started out in floating point logic design, then I did cache design, level two caches, level one caches. Um, but I've worked on FPGA-based accelerators. I've um, helped with the Nest architecture that we did on, on Telem 1. I've worked on AI accelerators, so I've, I've, I've been around the block and seen a <laughs> thing or two. So, so, so what was the first, do you remember the first chip you worked on? The very first chip I worked on was the cell processor for the PlayStation oh, back wow. then. Yeah. Wow. A long time ago. <laughs> yeah, I know, but there's so many interesting things about the cell. Oh yeah. It's, uh, we'll, we'll save that for a different interview. Um, but did you have any sort of you know, key highlights in your career that you're particularly you know, proud of, that sort of crystallized moment? Um, there's a few. Um, early on in my career, I was the uh, uh, logic lead for the load store unit. Um, mm -hmm. That's one of the really central units of the corp. And, and we did the uh, first out of order implementation. 
uh, back then on the, that ended up being the Z196 system. It's a bunch of years ago now, but <laughs> that was a huge assignment for me and I learned a lot. I actually went on assignment to Poughkeepsie from Germany for that, uh, for that uh, work. Then later I became the core lead on the Z14 and the overall um, chief architect for the Telem processor. Obviously, that's a big highlight. Mm -hmm. um, it's been, you know, it's been a good run. I, mm -hmm. I, I really enjoyed the 22 years so far, and I'm looking forward to many, many more to come. <laughs> and and so, so you were uh, chief architect with Telem One, and now you're sort of CTO Systems. What does that mean? I'm the CTO of System Development. So okay. we do um, obviously a lot of development activity in the different brands like Power Systems and Z Systems. Mm -hmm. And so I'm CTO for that organization, sort of connecting the dots, making sure that we cover the gaps that were connected into the broader IBM strategy, look into like where is IBM going from a broad AI story, how does it tie into um, like some of the consulting work and how do we prepare that side of the business when we bring out new systems, those kinds of things. So you've worked on Power. I've worked on power a few in a few projects, yeah. Okay, so 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 one one spiky thing I have to ask is, where is power right now? We don't hear often from them. Oh, power's in a really good place. Um, the uh, power ten system that's out in the market uh, is very successful, um, both from a like volume shipping out and from a financials perspective. And there's really good work going on for the power eleven chip and the power twelve chip. Uh, and we're already starting early conversations on what the generation after that will look like. Yeah. You, have to, you have to come back to me and start telling me about it. Yeah, we, we will. <laughs> I, I now have the contacts. You we, we will in due time. <laughs> so have you ever thought about moving from hardware to software? It's, a, it's funny. I've actually moved the other way. Uh, I started <laughs> you out, didn't want money. <laughs> I, <laughs> I started out as a programmer in a very small company in my hometown. And uh, we did um, enterprise resource planning software mm -hmm. development. Uh, and then I went to college, uh, University of, um, of Saarland in Saarbrücken, Germany. And in the very first class, 9.15, Monday morning, like literally the first class I take, the professor starts talking about AND gates and OR gates and <laughs> truth tables and full adders. And then he shows how you can add like multi-digit numbers, binary numbers using a chain of full adders. And I was hooked on hardware. <laughs> And that's all it took. Yeah, yeah, well, it took a little longer than that in the end, but um, I was pretty amazed by by that. Yeah. So, 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 I, I don't want to talk about um, you know Telem and the Z and the Z systems because that's what you're you know, you and your team are here presenting are hot chips. Um, how would you describe the Z architecture and the chips behind it, like Telem, to somebody who has no clue what IBM hardware does? So I would say. You have to first understand that IBM Z systems are the backbone of IT infrastructure in many large organizations, and they run their mission critical, like most sensitive workloads mm -hmm. uh, on those platforms. And because of that, it's super crucial that they are highly available, secure, scalable. Um, so there's a there's a lot that comes just from the recogni uh, recognition of, of of those use cases, and then the chips that we're building are designed for purpose, like always with that, like what are the workloads, what are the clients doing with those chips? Um, and, and that really inf is deeply infused in, in the design process as, as we go through the project from concept phase to execution and release. So what does is, what is high availability mean in this context? I mean, is, I, I can go to the cloud today and get uh, systems available to me there. Um, high availability means Eight nines of availability, ninety nine point nine 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 percent, and just to translate that, that turns into one year of downtime. Sorry, one hour of downtime every eleven thousand four hundred years. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it's a different standard. So, so we're doing tenth of a tenth of a second per year. Uh, yeah, or less than. Yeah, less than that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, so I, I, I've I've been following Z for a while. Um, pro, pro, Perhaps around you know, the fourteen era, I think that's that's when you, you first presented, and we'll, we'll get into some of the foundry stuff in a bit because I know that's been a bit up and down, and I don't know how much you're going to say about that. But from a chip design perspective, around that time you had compute processors and cache processors, and you know almost how we imagine chiplets today, yeah. <laughs> almost. But you, you know, lot, you know, one gigabyte of cache is just a chip mm -hmm. connected to multiple you know compute processors and then you had rack or trays and racks and that's how you got some of your high availability success now 
we're just talking almost about individual dies, maybe eight in a system, or you know, four pairs of two, but eight dies. Why the change from you know this sort of chiplet architecture <laughs> yeah. almost to this sort of unified? It, it wasn't exactly chiplet architecture, right? Mm -hmm. On the Z15, we had a, a class ceramic multi-chip module mm -hmm. with, I believe, six processor chips and one cache chip on on the module. I maybe a little, little off there, but roughly. Um, we went to the current design point because we could re we could reduce everything into a single chip while still growing performance and still growing the total number of available cores and add all the new functionality like the AI acceleration and post-quantum mm -hmm. security and cryptography and that, those things. There just wasn't a point anymore once we came up with that new cache architecture mm -hmm. um, to design two different chips. And so from a efficiency perspective, it just made sense to go to the dual chip module architecture mm -hmm. that we have on Telum and now continue on Telum 2. So would you say it was the, it, the way you've pitched it almost sounds like it was purely because you could do the cache. Uh, that was a huge a huge part of it, right? We spent, we had the, um, I forget the exact size, but it was about a gigabyte, like you said, on the L, mm -hmm. physical L4 cache. Mm -hmm. And when we came up with that virtual cache hierarchy design point where we use the very large L2 caches, mm -hmm. but then the ups and downs of every core make it so that they don't all equally use their L2, mm -hmm. we could use that spare L2 um, or underutilized L2 capacity as virtual L3 and virtual L4, we got to um, two gigabytes of cache actually mm -hmm. in a drawer of four DCMs. Uh, and so we ended up actually having more cache. We didn't need to mm -hmm. duplicate as much data anymore. When you're in the physical hierarchy, mm -hmm. you duplicate every line because it was inclusive. So whatever was in the L2 oh, okay. was also in yeah. the L3, yeah. was also in the L4. You ended up not actually getting that much additional real cache real estate yes. out of the dedicated chip. And so with that virtual cache architecture, mm -hmm. um, we ended up growing the effective available cache to the system and that became a big part of the performance gain on, mm -hmm. uh, on Telum 1. So when you build for things like high reliability, does it mean you have to approach the design of the core resources in a different way to perhaps oh, you would do a normal yeah. core? I would say this high availability and availability means two things really it means well it means many things but in particular two things it means you catch any error that happens in the system be that mm -hmm. because a transistor breaks down over you know due to wear over the lifetime or uh, you get particle injections or mm -hmm. whatever can happen right you detect the stuff and then you have great mechanisms to recover and you can't add this on top after the design is done you have to be really thinking about it from the get-go and i'll just give you an example when we designed the new L2 cache on Telum 1, we spent weeks and weeks and weeks figuring out how can we maintain the low latency mm -hmm. uh, so that we don't have an ECC correction circuit that flows between the L2 cache and the L1 cache because that's like three or so added cycles of latency to maybe that we didn't want to invest mm -hmm. without losing uh, obviously the error protection that you that you get when you have ECC. So and we ended up with a parity scheme plus a sort of a RAID scheme. Mm. So we run the parity directly into the L1 cache, but when something breaks, we can go back to the RAID scheme and recover the data. And okay. with that mechanism, we can actually, even if an entire SRAM instance would break, mm. maybe with like a catastrophic bit line, word line fail or clocking fail or so, we can continue to recover the data, right? But that had to be baked into the base design. That's not something you can add on at the, at the very end. So yeah, so when you're talking about the reliability, it is literally down to each cache line has to be able to support failover, yeah, and and, and redundancy and reliability and, and, and recovery mechanisms. When we detect an error, we have a this, the architectural state of the processor yeah. is saved in what we call the R unit, yeah. and every instruction that completes updates that checkpoint with ECC. Okay, and if um, an error yeah. gets detected, we basically can completely reinitialize the core. <laughs> and then load the architecture state back into the core and keep running, right? It's so it's those kinds of things. It does sound very different to this traditional core design. It is It is yeah. quite unique. It's. Um, I, I remember when you first announced you know, the fact that each core had a 32 megabyte L2, because I think at that point I'd be going through my um, you know, architecture journey of, of, of you know, cache size and latency, and given what I knew in the consumer space and a little bit in the enterprise space, and then you suddenly said 32 megabytes, I'm like, okay, that's gotta be like 26, 30 cycles. And you came up with 19. Yeah, and that's the average. The leading latency is actually like 16 or so. Yeah, it's insane. Yeah. It's insane. Um, so 
with with this you know massive amount of l2 and in the new chip you've gone up f- to 320 megabytes 360 360 actually. yeah yeah, yeah. Um, what does the effect of making that a virtual l3 and then an l4 across the system actually do to performance versus actually having a native l3 l4 well so in a classical cache hierarchy, you're duplicating a lot of cache lines, like I've described mm-hmm. before, right? With that virtual design. Is that true even with an exclusive cache? Um, most caches design are designed to be inclusive. So if you have like an L3, L4, mm-hmm. like you you want you to maintain- You mean the systems that Z is targeted for? We've, that we've done, yeah. yeah because yeah. you need the strong coherency, we're strongly ordered. Okay, um, okay. And so if you don't want to have too much intervention traffic, you want your last level cache to know exactly what cache line is where so that it can send the interventions to the right place and doesn't need to always broadcast interventions. That's very inefficient, right? So we've always maintained that full inclusivity so that the higher level cache knows where the cache lines are in the lower level caches and can yeah. target the interventions, uh, cache invalidations. Um, and so now with that virtual architecture, we mm-hmm. don't really need to replicate cache lines multiple times unless multiple cores want that cache line at the same time. Okay. And, and so that gives us a lot of efficiency uh, in, in the cache, like I mentioned earlier. So one of the new features, another, or at least another feature that came with Talum and that you'll maintain with Talum too, is this integrated AI processor. I have to ask, why? So this goes back to what I said at the very beginning, right? Being designed for purpose and understanding what that purpose is. Our clients, are running enterprise workloads, transaction processing databases. Mm -hmm. They want to infuse AI into those workloads. They are not about just running AI. And so when we decided we want to do, we want to enable clients to really use AI as part of Mm -hmm. their transactions and at transaction scale means like millisecond latency for each inference task. We thought about like pretty much everybody, how much AI do we need to add to each core? Mm -hmm. But then when when we went there, like thought that through, what we realized is when the cores are running their normal workloads, that AI circuitry sits idle. Mm-hmm. And then when they need, when a core that needs to do AI, it only gets its local AI capability. And we were like, that's not great. We're yeah. much better off taking all of that AI circuitry, consolidating it into one large area. And then whenever a core needs to do AI, mm-hmm. it can access that entire capacity And so we're giving it much more compute than we could allocate to each individual core. And then by exploiting the fact that we're a CISC architecture, Mm -hmm. we could actually make it so that um, the program runs on the main core and there's a CISC instruction for matrix multiplication, for convolution, et cetera. And sort of under the covers, that CISC instruction gets executed on the AI accelerator. And so we we get that it's part of the core but mm-hmm. only temporarily. And then when the next core wants to do AI, mm-hmm. that big AI engine becomes part of that core in a, in a certain it's, way. Yeah, I was, I, was, I was gonna bring this up because it is essentially you have your eight cores and then an AI acceleration unit. It's not say um, a small amount of compute on each core and then having a distributed Correct. stuff. Yes. But you're, you seem to apply that's because you know, the utilization is low compared to the rest of the compute? Um, no, I would say that, the again, the point is, it's not that the utilization of that AI engine necessarily is low, uh, mm-hmm. and we're seeing great adoption, and so of course that utilization is going up, which is why mm-hmm. on Telem 2, we're investing a lot to, to beef that capability up, and we can talk more about that, but uh, every core only performs AI a certain percentage of its time. Mm-hmm. When it performs that AI, we wanted to give it as much AI compute as possible. Mm-hmm. And if you just had spread that AI capacity across all eight cores, whenever a core does AI, it would only get whatever, one eighth of the can, AI. Can, can, but can you do, say, like a virtual compute capacity like you do with the caches? Well, that's what the AIU, <laughs> uh, the AI accelerator on the chip kind of does, right? Yeah. It is the core when it needs to do AI, temporarily attaches to the engine, mm-hmm. um, shoves the addresses down. Um, the engine is a first-class citizen on the on the um, on-chip cache fabric, and it can grab that data real fast and, and, and do the compute. And when that whatever matrix multiplication is done and another core wants to do AI, it mm-hmm. kind of attaches to it for the for the period in time and, and um, basically makes that unit logically yeah. part of that core. So was this the 
Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of want to approach this from a chicken and egg scenario. Were your customers coming to you and saying, we need an AI accelerator? Or were you guys thinking, well, let's put some AI in and then teach them how to use it? How does that, how did that work? So we work with our clients very in, in, uh, intensively. We have a number of um, client councils where we talk through different mm -hmm. technology developments and, and get input from them on like where they see the puck going. We give them input on what we think might be happening. This is like two to four years in advance. That happens two to four years in advance for the hardware and then obviously a little bit closer for like uh, um, the software. Like yeah. we are, I haven't mentioned this yet, but we're very stack integrated on the mainframe. And so we're really spanning that entire stack and that design thinking with clients. Uh, and so in that conversation with clients, we, we, sort of postulated that AI will be a big thing, but they mm -hmm. also looked at it from their side. They brought data scientists to the table and application okay. developers and, and agreed. And then we looked at like, well, what kind of use cases? How much compute do you need? Mm -hmm. What kind of models would you be running, right? So it's not like we came up with it and then told them, like, do this. Mm -hmm. Rather, like we said, AI is going to be important. Do you agree? And if you agree, can you bring your AI experts to the table mm -hmm. so that we better understand exactly how to build this? So the sorts of models that are run you know, on the on-chip AI, um, it, it, right now we're in a land of speaking about language models and billions of parameters. But you know, a few years ago we were talking about convolutional neural networks yeah. and tens of billions of parameters. A you know, transactional fraud detection model. Where does that fit in that spectrum? So. There's an interesting development. Like you said, a few years ago, we were talking about you know, tens, hundreds of, uh, of thousands of parameters or millions of parameters, mm -hmm. relatively small models compared to what we have today. And um, those models are somewhat underappreciated today, but they still, they still can do, uh, they can deliver a lot of value to mm -hmm. our clients in terms of catching most of the transactions, detecting whatever insurance claims fraud or, mm -hmm. or, or credit card fraud, whatever it may be. Um, they are fast, they are power efficient, mm -hmm. they have super low latency so that they can fit within the transaction. Uh, but what's also happened is that clients have figured out how to use large language models, specifically the encoder models, mm -hmm. to also do uh, fraud detection or things like that uh, with higher accuracy. And so... With still a small amount of parameters. Uh, with like a bird level kind okay. of a number okay. of parameters, 100 million parameters or something like yep. that. And so... Um, what we're seeing is this um, emergence of the ensemble method for AI where clients run the bulk of the transaction through a, a relatively simple model that they can do on the chip and get like mm -hmm. millisecond latency on the inference. The models not only say yay or nay on fraud, they also say the, you know, give their confidence yep. score. And so you use the sort of the fringes of the confidence spectrum and then go and say the top 10 and bottom 10 transactions, percent transactions, I'm going to run through this large language model to okay. get an overall better um, yeah. accuracy of the prediction. And we've actually designed a second chip for, mm -hmm. the, uh, for this next yeah. generation, the Spire chip, yeah. that is optimized for, for that use case of the large language models. I wanted to get that, to that in a second, but one of the criticisms I had, uh, I had heard coming into this is, Given the low amount of parameters in those models, sometimes you may get you know, a false positive rate of 10, 20, 30%. But you're saying, based on the fact that these can be fast, low power, and you also have a bigger model backing it up, if there are false positives, you can run it through again, 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 and then check. Yeah, and based on the confidence score of the, yeah. Of the lower model. Yeah, oh, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Um, and one of the big new features in the Telem 2 chip this time around is the built-in DPU. Mm -hmm. um, so this is like a high-speed, dedicated networking silicon. How would you how would you describe it? Well, I, it's not only networking. Um, uh, so, as you can imagine, mainframes process gazillions of transactions yeah. every terabytes second, right? terabytes and terabytes of DRAM. And and uh, so I/O plays a really important part in the mm -hmm. overall system structure and value proposition of the system. And so we were looking at what's the next sort of innovation in that space. Mm. And of course, the world is using DPUs now in, in a number of, of use cases. So we looked at the technology and you know, asked ourselves, is this a, a kind of an innovation space that makes mm. sense for us also? And as we considered it, we thought the typical DPU is really um, sort of implemented on the 
off processor side of the PCI interface, right? Yeah. And we were like, that technology is great, but it doesn't really make sense for us on the off processor side of the PCI interface. Uh, where we ended up putting it is directly on the processor chip. There's a DPU now which is directly connected to its mm -hmm. own 36 megabyte level two cache. So mm -hmm. it's a first class uh, participant in the overall yeah. system coherency. And we can run all of our enterprise class uh, IO um, uh, protocols, both for storage and for networking. On that DPU, there's uh, 32 programmable engines where that mm -hmm. firmware gets implemented, and then a bunch of dedicated I.O. acceleration logic. And what happens in those enterprise class um, um, protocols is they kind of communicate with the main processors mm -hmm. where the whatever transaction workload is running, create address lists, like where does the next block of data need yeah. to be put in the you know database buffer pool, the those DMA kinds of things. And, yeah. like, and the DPU can now coherently fetch these address lists and similar things out of the main memory of the of the main process okay. processing system without needing to go across the PCI bus. And that's just a simple example, but yeah. there's many of those interactions. And that you makes save latency, but you have to pay for it in die area on the main chip. We and that's okay. We pay for the die area on the main chip, but we save uh, latency. And again, I come back to design for purpose. Yeah. Um, this is what we're doing. And um, here we could have added more cores to the chip, but our clients weren't necessarily looking only for more cores. That's mm. that's one important dimension, yeah. but it's not the only important dimension. And in that trade-off of what makes the most sense, we decided to put that TPU directly on the processor chip. Uh, so yeah, so, so that does uh, the crypto, the RAS, and it has just direct memory access. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But what it connects to on the back end, right? We, we speak about say networking and DPUs. You you guys are um, using it essentially to extend your AI capability on the back end with this AI processor you call Spire. That is that is one part of uh, the PCI infrastructure, right? Behind the DPU. Uh, I.O. expansion drawers, mm -hmm. a fully populated system, can have 12 I.O. expansion drawers with uh, 16 PCI slots each. Okay. So that's 192 PCI say, slots they, in the machine. The math, yeah. that's, a lot of, that's a lot of I.O. capability. Yeah. And clients need that. Again, I'm coming back to the, the availability and mm -hmm. resilience. Clients build out fairly massive oh, I.O. infrastructures for it. failover yeah. and um, and yeah, exactly, redundancy and those things. But that also allows us now with the Spire adapter mm -hmm. to build out a very massive um, AI inferencing capability in the IO subsystem. So, so you, you could almost put anything in those BCI slots, the you know, crypto engines, the PQC stuff that you guys have. Yeah, we have, we have network adapters, we have yeah. storage connection, we have um, crypto HSMs, uh, yeah. and now we'll have um, AI adapters, and then there's a couple more then. So, so, so Spire, um, interesting name. I keep wanting to think of Spyro, the old PlayStation games, <laughs> speaking about cell processors earlier. Um, Spire looks to me as if it's just the AIU, the artificial intelligence unit from IBM that I've been taking bytes out of in, in videos of past. So what's different here? From IBM Research, yeah. yeah. So Spire is the second generation version of that chip. We've okay. been working very closely with our friends in Yorktown at IBM Research, even back to the Telem 1 days, mm -hmm. uh, the AI engine that's on the Telem 1 and that we now have enhanced for Telem 2, uh, was initially researched um, and developed in Yorktown. We, 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 the, in, in systems development, we took that design from research um, uh, and productized it on the processor and then added all of the RAS capabilities and brought it to the frequency of the of the Telem yes. 1 processor and so on and so forth. When you say added, did it mean you, you it was built and then you had to change or were you involved in the conversation? They, there, was a, there were research projects going on and we were advising the research projects okay. early on, on like, hey, design it this way or that way, then it makes it easier to bring it over. In the but same way you have your customer councils. Uh, similar, yeah, yeah. But that was like early days of, of AI research where we weren't even like in the game yet. Do we want to do AI on the sure. chip or not? So I'm, I'm back like five, six, seven, eight years yeah. now, right? Um, but that's great to have a research organization that thinks that far ahead, mm -hmm. right? And then does it in a way that is close enough to what we're doing in system development to be able to transfer those assets that come out of research that are not quite product ready, uh, that we then can take with a product team and, and work together with the research team to productize them. And the same thing happened uh, with the Spire chip. There was a, mm. a prototype that research put out 
Um, when we decided we do need something for large language model capabilities uh, on the Z systems as well, we worked with the research team. We had a bunch of our own engineers work together with them to put the second generation out, which now has like all of the enhance enhancements that you need in an enterprise setting, like virtualization capabilities yeah. and such. So uh, uh, are these Spire accelerators attached to the Z chips? Um, you mentioned LLMs before as sort of like the, you know, a, a back-end check to the fraud detection. Is that all they're used for? No, this is that is one main use case. Mm -hmm. um, there's a second main use case for the Spire chip. Um, we do have generative use cases on the platform as well, okay. not for, I'll say, general purpose chatbots or something mm -hmm. like that, but very specifically, for example, for code assistance or general okay. sysadmin assistance. Um, our clients run like massive software applications. Some clients have hundreds of millions of lines mm -hmm. of code. And of course, AI is a technology they want to apply um, when, when optimizing that code, doing code transformation, explanation, things like that. And the code base is extremely sensitive. Think about it. Mm -hmm. um, that code base represents how to run a bank or how yep. to run an insurance company, right? You need it in a sovereign And so they, they have a great interest in keeping that code base on the mainframe. Mm -hmm. And when they, wanna, when they run AI models for, say, code assistance, they rather not have that, that code base flow off to some other system. Mm -hmm. And so we're taking the Spire adapter, the Spire chip, um, and can cluster eight of them into uh, a generative AI cluster okay. that then has the you know, compute capacity and the memory bandwidth and all that to get a really good user experience when running generative workloads like Watson Code Assistant for Z. Mm -hmm. So when can I buy it on Amazon? <laughs> I'll put you in contact with my sales team here. <laughs> yeah, one please. One please. We're like, no, it must be 100 at least. Um, so one thing I did want to touch on is the fact that you know, IBM's tour around Foundry offerings has been almost kind of well documented. Um, and now you guys are working with Samsung for these chips. Both of the chips were in five nanometer different you know, variants. Um, you guys used to require, you know, a super specialized high frequency process. Um, so I want to ask, how's the relationship with Samsung on, on these, you know, highly optimized it's, IBM specialized it's, things? It's fantastic. It's fantastic. I mean, we come from a, a background where we did our own development mm -hmm. of technology, silicon nodes, right? Along with research and our technology development division and manufacturing, which we no, no longer do. We use Samsung. We're mostly using their high performance process as mm -hmm. is. There's very few tweaks we're doing, okay. like the number of metal layers. Mm -hmm. um, and we're really, really happy with the relationship. They, they have like great performance, great yield. Um, mm -hmm. It's a wonderful partnership. Are you using AI in your chip design? We are. Um, uh, I, um, I, I ask that because we're here at Hot Chips Day Zero tutorial. And all of this morning was about AI and chip design. We, so. we are getting there. Um, there's a number of projects going on right now where we're looking at using AI for um, uh, simulation screening. We're using AI for uh, just a general sort of know-how engine mm -hmm. where you can like load a lot of design data into the and documentation and emails and Slack threads and all that into into a rack database and you can use that sort of as a Q&A machine when you're yeah. sitting at 3 a.m. on the test floor and you're wondering how something works and you can't find the right person. Um, I'll say it's in its early days, mm -hmm. um, but we're getting there. What's really interesting is we've got to figure out, like as you can imagine, it's not as easy as like I'll just load everything in a rack database, right? You, those are very sensitive, security relevant information. Not everybody has access to everything. So how do you build a rack database that has like user specific access rights and user specific uh, credentials to certain documents, not other documents? That's a really complicated space. And what, I'm, what excites me about that is I believe that most of our clients will have similar issues when it comes to actually using AI. So in a way, we're kind of client zero and figuring out some of those things and then apply it to others in the industry. I was going to say, that sounds very much like you know, IBM consulting product that they are, that they like. There's a pipeline here that I think yeah. could happen where we figure out some things inside IBM yeah. and then take that learning and experience and productize it both sort of as software products and as consulting assets. So when I speak to companies, they're, you know, they're talking about latest generation hardware, then research one to three years, then uh, you know, early testing, three to five, and then pathfinding, five to seven. 
you're doing all of that and then you know, a few beyond? We have, at any point in time, at least three projects in flight on, the, on just the main processors for Z. Yeah. Um, Power has the same and you Power has the AIs. same and now, obviously, now that we've announced Spire, right? Yeah. That we're working on future generations of mm -hmm. that as well. So there's a, there's a cadence of chip development that's mm -hmm. going on. We have our own crypto accelerators that we're putting out every few years. So that there's uh, stuff in development on that side. There's there's a lot of projects um, going on right now. It's an exciting time. What's been the response to Linux One? The, Fantastic. The, the, so this is Linux on Z essentially. Yeah. So so let me just clarify. Right. We have basically two brands. We have IBM Z and we have Linux One. And on IBM Z, you run a lot of the traditional workloads: ZOS, Kix, IMS, DB2, those kinds mm -hmm. of things. But you can also run Linux there. Uh, and in fact, you actually can run Linux inside a ZOS environment as a oh. container extension okay. now. And then we have a second brand, Linux One, which is really dedicated sort of to Linux-only applications. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we have clients who use both, right? We have clients who use IBM Z and they use Linux One machines for like, mm -hmm. that aspect. Uh, overall, Z is growing very healthily um, and Linux One is the fastest area of growth for us right now. Where do you think you spend most of your time dealing with customers on one or the other? Um, well, what's really interesting is in those councils, we, yeah. have, uh, we have representatives from both. And like I said, many clients use both. Um, and when you look at it, the requirements that one set drives, at least on the hardware side, of course, mm -hmm. it's different on the software side. Um, it's very similar. Like what you would do to have a high performance, high available, highly scalable, um, solution for like databases on ZOS mm -hmm. is the same stuff that you really need to run a workload consolidation of many database instances onto a Linux One server, right? So there's very rarely is there a competition of like this side wants mm -hmm. this and that side wants that. It's kind of really working together very okay. nicely. Because some good synergy going. Yeah, there. I mean, think about it. Like if you consolidate thousands of databases into a single server, mm -hmm. what do you need? You need availability, you need security, you need scale and performance, yeah. right? It's the same stuff. Okay. Um, so we're here day zero tutorial day, and Christian's kindly flown in and is a bit jet lagged. Um, but tomorrow, you and your colleagues, um, and I know Chris Barry's sitting over there, uh, are presenting uh, tomorrow on these two chips. For those people who are watching this video but haven't had a chance to go to hot chips, what should be the takeaway from IBM's presentation? So I would say the Mainframes are a really important IT part, infrastructure part mm -hmm. for many large organizations. That's one. And two, IBM is very innovative in the chip space and uh, builds fit for purpose chips in that space. And are you hiring? Uh, we are. <laughs> so there are jobs out there, people. Yeah. <laughs> go, 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 hit Christian up. Thank you so much Thank you. for taking your time. Um, there will be links down in the description if you do want to find out about Z and tell them to and the new spy processes. And uh, thank you all for watching and we'll see you on the next one.